Welcome to the third annual Dr. Jack Dean Kingsbury Lecture in New Testament Theology. Uh, this evening's lecture is entitled, Who is Able to be Saved? As far as man is concerned, it is impossible entering the kingdom of God according to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the lecture will be given by Dr. Jim Veltz, the Dr. Jack Dean Kingsbury Professor of New Testament Theology. Uh, not only is Dr. Veltz with us, but also Dr. Kingsbury, who was a 1959 graduate of Concordia Seminary, and in his long career in teaching and study and writing, established an excellent reputation not only as a teacher and as an advisor, uh, but internationally as uh, an authority on the Gospels and in uh, New Testament interpretation. But not only is Dr. Kingsbury uh, with us, he has not forgotten Concordia Seminary. In fact, he has uh, graciously endowed a chair in New Testament theology. And its first occupant is Dr. Veltz. From, since 2015, he has been the, uh, the Kingsbury Professor of New Testament Theology. The, uh, the question about the kingdom of God, of course, comes from Mark's gospel. And uh, Jesus' own answer to the question, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God, is something like this. It's really, really hard. <laughs> and if you're rich, well, all the harder. You all know this, all right? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This, of course, astonishes the disciples who asked, uh, who was able to be saved? And Jesus' answer starts with, as far as man is concerned, it is impossible. Of course, that's not all he said, but that's a lot all by itself to chew on. So Dr. Veltz will lead us through that, but before that, I would like to invite Dr. Kingsbury to come forward and say a few words, and I would invite you to, again to express your appreciation. Nobody told me that I was going to have to say something. Is this, can you hear me all right? You know, I'm from California. And so coming back to St. Louis for seminary was quite a, quite a thing. And we came here and the first, we drove, I and a couple other fellows, we drove here and the first thing that greeted us was the Luther statue. Well, if you're in California, it's not the most populous place for Lutherans. And so just to see that someone erected a, a statue to Mar of Martin Luther, that, was, that, that pleased us greatly because we thought we finally belonged somewhere. <laughs> well, I went through seminary here and afterwards I decided what would I like to do? And almost everybody in my class, probably the same with your classes, everyone was taking a parish. But I decided I would like to go further. And I had met a professor by the name of Herman Weichen. I don't know if any of you have heard that name. But he went to the University of Tübingen in Germany and he got his doctoral degree there and he wrote on Matthew's Gospel. He offered the summer I graduated, that summer, Herman Weichen offered a course on Matthew. I took that course and I was thrilled. Do you know why? Because he was dealing in redaction criticism. Redaction criticism was otherwise not taught. And so I felt here is an avenue, a fresh way of looking at the Gospels, especially the Gospels, and I'd like to pursue that. It was Weichen's course that sent me to Europe. I too went to the University of Tübingen and I did postgraduate work. But then the two professors there, Professor Michel, Otto Michel, he wrote two commentaries 
one on Romans and one on, um, on uh, yeah, what was it? And one on one of the epistles. <laughs> and uh, I went over there and these two professors, I found out, did not get along. And so I had a topic and I was going to work on this topic and it had to do with John's gospel. But I went and talked to the, um, to the uh, two, two students, if really they were professors, junior professors, about how the professor, Kazeman or Michel, how they would treat this topic I was going to deal with. And it had to do with tradition in John's gospel. And so the one fellow told me, he said, well, he said, uh, watch out because Kazeman wants you to look at this from a Hellenistic standpoint. And I went to the other fellow, the other assistant, and he said to me, well, Professor Michel uh, would like to do this, looks at, at John from a, a Jewish standpoint. And so I thought, okay, here I am. I'm going to be right between these people and they're going to decide my fate. I will have worked years and I don't know that I'd even get through. So I heard of Oscar Kuhlman. He talked about salvation history and he was at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And so Tübingen is in southern Germany. Basel isn't that far away. So I went down to Basel and I knocked on his door. Well, I got in anyway. And Professor uh, Oscar Kuhlman uh, said, well, would you like to come to Basel? And I said, yeah, I'd like to come to Basel. And so you see, Bo Rika was a professor at Rika, and the other one was Oscar Kuhlman, and both of them were Lutherans. Now, Kuhlman was a Strasburger Lutheran, and uh, Bo Rika was a Swedish Lutheran. So they had their differences, but nevertheless, they were both Lutheran. So I switched to Basel, and I took my degree there. I just want to say now, as one who is had a different kind of education in certain respects, and one who has always been far away, California or Europe, or when I taught teaching, you know, in the East, never quite around, never quite getting to see Concordia and how it developed. So I was invited to speak here, what, two, three years ago, and I must say, Coming back to see Concordia is a real thrill. And that's going to happen to you as you get older. You're going to cherish more and more the professors you had, the seminary you attended, and you will do your very best in order to uphold the honor of that seminary. So that's what we're doing tonight, and Jim is making his contribution. He'd be too shy to tell you, but greatest uh, New Testament theologian in the English-speaking world in the late 20th century. It's really a privilege. <laughs> After the introduction by uh, Joel, I thought I was ready to say thank you and good night as you went through the passage. Uh, I hope you all have uh, an outline. On the back is a, um, a Velsian translation with all kinds of uh, turbocharging there, as you can see at the bottom. And uh, you can follow along with that. Uh, who is able to be saved? As far as man is concerned, it is impossible. Entering the kingdom of God according to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Last year at the second annual Jack Dean Kingsbury Chair Lecture, I spoke about Jesus as the atonement, the lutron, for many standing in for us in the face of divine wrath against sin and rescuing us from Satan's power, focusing on Mark 10:45. In continuation of this salvation theme and to achieve a focus on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, this year I will focus on salvation coming 
to us what it looks like and how that is accomplished. I will do so by considering in detail a key pericope, also in the middle section of the Gospel of Mark, that focuses on Jesus' general turn away from the crowds toward his disciples and their instruction, Mark 10, 17 to 31. Point B, Mark 10, 17 to 20. This complex pericope begins with a man approaching Jesus and asking, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? There's a lot to unpack in just this statement, which could take all evening, but let me do so briefly. First, good teacher. It was rare in Jewish circles to address a man as good. Goodness belongs to God. Does this indicate that the man saw Jesus as divine? Much depends upon how the statement is phrased. Is it ironic? Is it flattery? Is it, in the words of C.E.B. Cranfield, conventional effusiveness? Then, what shall I do in order to inherit eternal life? This is the key clause of our entire pericope in many ways. What shall I do? And we will return to it again and again. The orientation of this question determines how Jesus deals with the man and why Jesus makes the strong statement that he does concerning salvation in 1027. What shall I do in order to inherit eternal life? These words are the next focus. The conjunction hina in the Greek, in order that, shows that the man has intentions for his actions and his mention of eternal life picks up the theme of life, zoe in Greek, introduced a little earlier in Mark's Gospel in chapter 9, where it's contrasted with Gehenna, unquenchable fire in 943 to 47. Both there and here, the subject seems to be the full and final blessings of the end time reign and rule of God. And the verb inherent is important, inherit is important too. If the analysis of E.P. Sanders is correct, and there's controversy about this, but I think his evidence is pretty good on this point, contemporaneous Jews believe that they got into the covenant of the saved people of God by God's grace, but that they stayed in that covenant or among those people by their obedience to God's commands. The man's question may very well reflect such an attitude so that he is asking actually what he must do in order to stay in to obtain the full and final manifestation of the eschatological reign and rule of God. Jesus responds. His initial reply to all of what we have described in verse 18 is, Why do you call me good? Only one is good, God. Which itself is a powerful question and statement directed to someone who is interested in doing the proper thing on his own. He then points the man to a number of the Ten Commandments that he must do. All of which, please notice are confined to the second table of the law. So you have murdering and adultery and so forth. When the man asserts his righteousness with regard to these laws, our Lord moves his focus to the man's possessions and asks him to sell all and to give to the poor, which is in effect a refocusing to the first table of the law, specifically the first commandment about having other gods. A favorite emphasis of Martin Luther in his understanding of the commandments as we know. And by the way, David Maxwell referred to this in his great presentation this afternoon from the large catechism. Uh, paragraph two, a God is that to which we look for all good and in which we find refuge. Therefore, I repeat, to have a God properly means to have something in which one's heart trusts completely. Included in this command to sell all and to give to the poor in order to have treasure in heaven then 
is an implicit inquiry into the man's God or highest good. The fact that the man, who we now learn is rich, soon goes away with a dark countenance and grieving, verse 22, shows that he has, in fact, taken Jesus' words as sheer demand, which they are, demands that are unfulfillable. In Lutheran terms, Jesus has driven him to despair. It is noteworthy that, as in this text, Jesus engages commandments from the Torah only with those outside the end time, the eschatological reign and rule of God, that end time rule that has come ahead of time, or we might say proleptically into history in the person and work of Christ. If you could put up the diagram now. There it is. Uh, I have the most low-tech, high-tech. All right? This is a photograph of a diagram in a book. All right? <laughs> Nothing electronic. But here we are. The consummation. The end. The full end. The full manifestation of the eschatological end time uh, reign and rule of God. And that comes as a foretaste. In St. Paul's words, a down payment or a first fruit in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Often the Gospels call this the kingdom of God. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. <clears throat> now, uh, to return here to the business of uh, uh, the commands of the Torah only to those outside the eschatological reign and rule of God in Christ. See also chapter 12, verses 28 and 34, where Jesus discusses commandments with one of the scribes. This confirms two points made earlier in Mark's gospel. First, that new wine is present in Jesus, and it is not put into old wineskins, 2.22. But second, that the old wineskins, the old, do have a place and should not be destroyed. You know, in that text it says, and the wine is lost if you put it in the old wineskins and the skins. Why the concern about the skins? Because those skins still have a function. It is used to enclose all things under sin in order that the promise on the basis of faith in Christ might be given to those who believe in the words of Galatians 3.22. What now becomes critical in Jesus' response is the next clause on your outline, the Greek there, doira akaluthai. I'm sorry I did not transliterate. I forgot that the thing that looks like a P in the first word is an R, and the tall letter in the second word is an L. Doira akaluthai. Come follow me. That occurs after, after Jesus' commands in 1021. We need to spend some time on this. The first word, doira, is technically an adverb meaning hither, toward me. Or as the Liddell and Scott lexicon puts it, come on. And it functions along with an imperative, normally present tense, akaluthai, such as our second word, as an entreaty. My dear wife who's here in the fourth row says that it should be translated, come here, pookie. <laughs> come here, pookie. An excellent example is in Homer's Iliad, Book 11, 314, when Odysseus entreats Diomedes, son of Tydeus, after Hector has killed a number of important warriors, and the Achaeans, or the Greeks, were ready to go to their ships and flee back home. And he says, come here, gentle friend, stand by me. See also Iliad 3, 130, where the goddess Iris, in disguise, 
says to Helen of Troy, come here, beloved young wife, in order that you might see the wondrous works of the Trojans and the Achaeans. This adverb and imperative then denote a friendly, kindly invitation. This changes everything. And that in two respects. First, it takes the focus off of the full and final manifestation of the reign and rule of God and places it onto Jesus and therefore onto the initial coming of this end time reign and rule in him. This change of focus is both necessary and appropriate. Necessary because it is the first thing needful by someone, not under the eschatological reign and rule of God. And it's appropriate since that proleptic coming in Jesus is fully congruent with the final coming and issues in it. Second, and this is more important, with this clause, Jesus no longer speaks sheer demand. Thus, with doira akaluthai, Jesus extends a kindly invitation. In fact, even a gracious one. When we remember that the text tells us in chapter 10, verse 21, that Jesus looked the man in the face and loved him. Agapao. The point now is, the man inquiring seems to have recognized neither point, given his reaction. On the one hand, he sees, come on, Pookie, follow me, as a continuation of sheer demand. And he sees the topic still as of final destiny. On both counts, he could not be more wrong. Point C, Mark 10, 23 to 27. In response to this development and introducing the second section of our pericope, 10, 23 to 27, Jesus says to his disciples, which are now his focus, how hardly Hard, it's an adverb. How hard, with difficulty, will those who have possessions enter the reign and rule of God, 1023? This exclamation, exclamation picks up both points that I talked about above. First, it shows that with this kindly invitation, Jesus is talking about entering the eschatological reign and rule of God, which is the critical issue for the man and for everybody else. You might say the man was trying to run before he could walk. But second and more important, Jesus' statement shows that the man's circumstances, his possessions, his riches, have been standing in the way of his understanding, much less embracing Jesus' kindly, friendly, gracious, come on, Pookie, follow me. Why is this so? Taking the clue from the man's initial question, as well as considering statements and assertions from the rest of the pericope and in the near context in Mark's gospel, we may say the following. Those who are rich are not needy, and they do not see themselves as needy, certainly not fully needy individuals, plus, those who are rich really are quite able, and so they see themselves as quite able. For both of these reasons, they are ready to say, what shall I do in every circumstance? In their experience, any need they may have is limited, and the ability to contribute something to a solution to any problem is always present for them or to put it in terms congruent with the context of this pericope more specifically, the rich do not see themselves as, 
nor do they behave as children. Note that Jesus express, addresses the disciples as children, te, tekna, in 1024. And he said in 1015, just before our pericope, whoever does not receive the reign and rule of God as a little child, paideon, shall surely not enter into it. Children are fully needful, and they are unable to provide for themselves, and such the rich are not. Furthermore, because they are not children, the rich are not able to receive, which is what must happen relative to the reign and rule of God. This may be why Jesus uses the adject, adverb and then adjective diskalos or diskalon, difficult, which has a connotation of unpleasantness to it. In our text then, they, such as the rich, are not able to receive Jesus' kindly gracious invitation. And this is why, as noted before, the rich man understood the invitation as sheer demand. Now, Jesus' statements regarding those with possessions entering the reign and rule of God in 1023 also sets off and begins an important chain of statements and questions in the current subsection of 1023 to 27 that evince the following pattern. One, an initial statement about the difficulty of the rich entering the reign and rule of God, 1023. Then, after the disciples' reaction in 1024a, a second more general statement regarding the basic difficulty of entering the reign and rule of God at all. And then third, a statement including the camel comparison, Joel, once again regarding the difficulty of a rich man entering the reign and rule of God. The ordering of these statements now, Difficulty for the rich, general difficulty at all, difficulty for the rich, forms an ABA pattern, often called an intercalation by Mark and scholars, and is common in the Gospel of Mark. Now you notice how I've laid that out on your outline. A, difficulty for the rich. B, basic difficulty. A, prime, difficulty for the rich. So, this is common in the Gospel of Mark. You have, for example, in chapter 11, Jesus inspecting the temple after Palm Sunday entry in 11.11. Jesus cursing the fig tree in 11.12-14. And Jesus entering the temple again and cleansing it in 11.15-17. Temple, fig tree, temple. And as with all intercalations, in the case at hand, the central element, the B, is the focus. Just like the central position of the cursing of the fig tree tells us that the temple is doomed. Note the inclusion of the word address, techna, children, in that middle central section about entering the reign and rule of God at all. This analysis is confirmed by the disciples' question in 1026 that follows Jesus' third statement, the A prime one. They ask, who is able to be saved? Notice, it's a general question. Who is able to be saved? 
concerning entering the reign and rule of God. It doesn't concern the rich. He do, they don't ask, how are the rich able to be saved? So it is congruent then with the central element, the B element on your uh, diagram of the intercalation. Now I want you to notice how the who is able to be saved, I've indented this, and I want you now as class participation to put in front of who is able to be saved, B prime. See, because it actually corresponds. Now Jeff Gibbs will really be pleased with this part. <clears throat> Jeff, I'm developing a new theory now that there are not only intercalations, but this is the new thing, stepping stone pattern. A, B, A, B. And it only happens on the really important intercalations. And this is one of them. It, by the way, it also happens on that one with the temple because uh, after he cleanses the temple, then they go out and Peter observes the fig trees withered. A, B, A prime, B prime. Stepping stone pattern. <clears throat> it is noticeable that this pattern of thoughts, that is the statements and questions, has the effect, if you're just doing A, B, A, has the effect of making the outer envelope of the ABA intercalation a special or signal case of the more general problem or issue. The disciples seem to be thinking in effect. <clears throat> the rich are blessed by God. They have so many advantages. If they cannot enter the reign and rule of God, who can? In other words, it's not really about the rich. They simply reveal the difficulty, that of receiving as children, God's eschatological reign and rule in Christ. What we have said receives additional confirmation by Jesus' next statement regarding possibilities relative to man and God, which is a, also a general, even global statement. And to this we now turn. So on your outline there, that's this possibility one coming up next. It is worth taking a very close look at Jesus' final statement of this subsection, 1023 to 27, regarding the ability of men and God, usually translated, with men it is impossible, but not with God, and that's in the ESV. We begin by observing that the grammar of this statement is a bit trickier than most suppose. With, in the translations, renders the preposition para in the Greek, and you can see it there, I put it out for you, used with the date of case. But para in this construction does not mean with with man, with God, in the sense of for man or for God. Describing ability. <clears throat> Rather, it means as far as man is concerned or as far as God is concerned. We can see this usage, you see the citation on your outline, in 1 Corinthians 3.19, which has the same construction. The wisdom of this world is foolishness paratotheo. This has nothing to do with God's ability or anything. It is foolishness as far as God is concerned. Or in his opinion, or something like that, in the judgment of God. Plato, in Gorgias 5.10e, offers a close parallel as well. In fact, para plus the dative is often used in the context, uh, context of the viewpoint of a judge or somebody in authority. Now, if an emphasis on judgment or assessment 
is to be seen in this construction. And by the way, that's reflected in the title of my presentation at the top of your outline there. <clears throat> then the meaning of these words of Jesus most likely convey the following. As far as man's judgment is concerned, it is impossible. But not as far as God's judgment is concerned. Such an understanding may well be confirmed both by the disciples' own wonderment at who is able to be saved. 1026. As well as by the rich man's depressed reaction to Jesus' words to him in 1022. What follows is similar. Panta gar dunata para to theo. All things are possible as far as God is concerned. All things gives a global referent. And with it, Jesus makes sure that both entering the reign and rule of God and receiving its full and final blessings are covered by his statement. Okay. What does this mean then in the present context? As far as man is concerned, the key to entry into the reign and rule of God lies with demands. And as a result, everything is understood as demand. Even Jesus' kindly, come on, pooky invitation. Furthermore, as far as man is concerned, these demands cannot be fulfilled. It is for this reason that the rich man reacts the way he does. <clears throat> as far as God is concerned, the key to people entering his reign and rule lies with himself. Let me say that again. As far as God is concerned, the key to entering his reign and rule lies in himself. God understands not only that he is the creator of all things on your sheet, Genesis 1.1. Not only that he is the one who chooses people to be his own, Deuteronomy 7.6. The Lord your God chose you especially Septuagint, Deuteronomy 7, 6, <clears throat> where the middle voice, pra ilata, is used, chose you deliberately for himself. But also that he alone is the one who saves. Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Septuagint Isaiah 63, 5. I looked and there was no help. Bo'ethos. You can see it on there. Bo'ethos. My right hand rescued them. <clears throat> or Masoretic text Isaiah 63, 5. I looked and there was not a helper. And my right hand saved for me. Li. focuses even on God as the beneficiary. See also 2 Chronicles 20, 1 to 15, in which the battle is declared to be God's alone. Let us put it this way. In the Kairos, the critical time, this word Kairos occurs several verses later. In the critical time of the appearance ahead of time, proleptically, in history, in the Christ event of the eschatological reign and rule of God, it is God's understanding that he alone is doing a new thing. Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. See also Isaiah 42, 9 and Isaiah 48, 6. No one else. And in Jesus' person and work, he is doing that.
Indeed, this truth helps us to a fuller understanding of one other key element of 10, 24, and 26 as well. Jesus calls his disciples children, techna, in 24, indicating that they are truly his uh, followers who perforce have actually received the end-time eschatological reign and rule of God in him. Yet in 1024 and in 1026, the disciples do not understand regarding entry into this reign and rule. They have received, yet they do not understand. Jesus' statement regarding ability in 1027 reveals how and why this can be so. It's that even the reception of the reign and rule of God, even acceptance or positive response to Jesus' kindly invitation is also the work of God. See John 6, 44. No one is able, Dinatai, to come to me except the Father who has sent me draw him. No ability, no merit, even in the acceptance, in the proper judgment of God, he needs to do it all, and he does it all. Point D. Mark 10, 28 to 31. The final section of this important portion of Mark's gospel returns to the original theme of obtaining the full and final blessings of the eschatological reign and rule of God. Okay, on the right side, the consummation. And does so through Peter's question in 1028, Behold, we have left all things and have followed and are now followers of you. Given the progress of the thought of this pericope, Peter is likely not asking about entry into the reign and rule of God. Jesus' response strongly suggests as much because he does not rebuke Peter as he's ready to do in the gospel for all other false understandings. See 833, get behind me, Satan, when Peter says he shouldn't be going to the cross. Instead, he develops a positive answer. Peter's inquiry may be paraphrased thus. In the light of what you've said, Teacher, does what we have done count for anything at all? Look, we've left all and are now your followers. Jesus' reply is definite and heavy. Mark uses the verb me. Jesus declares. Occurs for the first time in 9.12 and it only occurs in very heavy statements. <clears throat> Jesus begins his saying with amen, truly, something indicate, indicating that something solemnly important is coming. It now concerns life within the eschatological reign and rule of God, 10, 29 to 30. There is no one who has left, he says. Note the difference between what Jesus tells Peter and what he tells the rich man at the beginning of the text. To highlight the latter's inability, he tells him first to obey commandments, to sell all, give to the poor, in order to inherit eternal life, which he cannot do, and only then does he invite him to follow him. Come on, Pookie. Here, Jesus speaks of leaving house and brothers or sisters on account of me and on account of the gospel. It's what one does after one receives the gracious reign and rule of God. Jesus then shares what the results of such actions are, both within the present critical time, Kairos, when the end time 
reign and rule is present proleptically ahead of time in him. And in the coming age, or the consummation of that gracious reign and rule. The first involves the theme first enunciated in chapter 3 regarding who Jesus' true family is. Now Jesus tells us that being part of that family means in the present critical time that you will have all of these other companions with you. The second, much more briefly presented, gives the long-term benefit, eternal life. Eternal life is the very theme with which our pericope began, and it shows, in fact, how the rich man could get to his stated goal. It begins with, involves, and is centered in Jesus and the good news gospel of what he has come to bring. This interpretation allows us then to understand the force of 1031, which is the final verse. This pronouncement regarding first and last, last and first, does not concern both those inside and outside the eschatological reign and rule of God. Rather, it concerns status within the final manifestation of the reign and rule of God. And as far as illocutionary force is concerned, how the statement functions, what it counts as, it constitutes a rebuke of Peter and his outlook. It's not a rebuke of his question itself. Rather, it's a rebuke of the assumption behind the question. Note Peter's we, hey mice. The use of the pronoun as an express subject is emphatic in Greek. We have done something and now we have special status. We, who have argued about who is the greatest, 934, we who have tried to prohibit a no-name person from working under your gracious reign and rule, casting out demons, in 938, we who have tried to prohibit mere children from approaching you, in 1013, Jesus' words prick that blue. Many will be first who are now last. That's the best way to translate the Greek. Poloi esuntai protoi eskatoi, kai eskatoi protoi. And the last first. Insignificant ones like the little children whom the firsts wanted to present, prevent Jesus from touching, their reward is status in the full and final manifestation of the eschatological reign and rule of God. Compare Luke 14, 7 to 11, especially verse 11. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There will be a lot of surprised people at the second coming of our Lord. Conclusion. That's on the back side. We have taken quite a tour through one of St. Mark's central stories. It's a lot there. One final observation. The entire pericope itself comprises a very large A, B, A prime intercalation, as you see I've laid out there. The first and last sections have as their focus obtaining within the age to come eternal life the full and final eschatological reign and rule of God. The central section has as its focus entering the eschatological reign and rule of God that has come ahead of time proleptically in Jesus Christ coming under its sway and blessings, and in so doing, it speaks of everything being dependent upon God in all respects. How appropriate this is, given that the central section of any intercalation is the primary or key section, as it were, as it is here. In concert with the rest of the sacred scriptures, 
it declares clearly that salvation rests in God alone in all respects. What good news this truly is. It makes one proud to be an heir of Martin Luther and of the Reformation. Thanks very much. <clears throat>
So that's, that's what the title is. It's a, really a quote from Hans Frey, uh, the press of the text on us as God comes to us in his word. And it's, a, I think, a fit uh, description of Jim's teaching. And I just wanted to mention, uh, again, what a privilege it is for me. I've known Jim for uh, decades, and it's just a real privilege to uh, have learned under him and be a colleague of his and good friend. Uh, and I just want to mention some of the authors. Uh, we tried to... Uh, Look to the next slide. We tried to uh, uh, convey some of the feel of how wide Jim's uh, connections are. Uh, he's an active member of the Society of Biblical Literature and also an active member of the Society of New Testament Studies. And so in addition to having some uh, colleagues from here at the Salmons from the Missouri Synod, uh, we have uh, Larry Brennan, who was the, uh, used to be the dean at Kenrick Seminary. Jim initiated dialogues between Concordia and Kenrick, the Roman Catholic Seminary here in town. Uh, we have Chris Karagounis, who's in Greece and uh, used to be at Lund, Sweden. Uh, it's kind of funny about... Uh, Karagounis, he, uh, he insists on uh, the full Greek name, the full Greek spelling of every name. So you can't call him Plato, you have to say Platon. And you can't say Homer, you have to so say Homerus. It's, it's just kind of funny. He wants the full Greek spelling. Uh, Keith Elliott from England. Um, Charles Geeshan from Fort Wayne. David Hasselbrook is a pastor here in the Missouri Senate. Uh, Bernard Ladahan from South Africa, uh, Michael Bindor from Irvine, he, Concordia Irvine, he was one of Jim's students. Jesus Palais is uh, from Spain, and he's working on the lexicon, the Greek-Spanish lexicon in Spain. He's a Roman Catholic. Uh, Gary Phillips, uh, Wabash uh, College here. Uh, Dieter Reinsdorf, South Africa. Wilson Schultz, Brazil. Um, uh, Gerald West, South Africa, and then Mark Seifert here, and Bill Weinrich uh, at Fort Wayne, and uh, Tom Winger at St. Catharines. So we have, what did we count, five, uh, five different? Seven countries and four continents. Seven countries and four continents. And uh, they were all uh, uh, happy to contribute, and uh, we had a, a fun time putting this volume together. And they're on sale for a discount price. Let me add a final word. Uh, you'll see at the bottom it says, with a tribute by Jack Dean Kingsbury. And we are honored, and Jim is honored, to have had you do that. I will quote just the first line. James W. Veltz is one of the finest New Testament scholars, whether in this country or abroad. And then you go on to cite and discuss uh, what he has done. Uh, the closing remarks from the foreword. The year 2014 was marked by the first volume of Jim's, or Dr. Veltz's Mark commentary. In a coming year, we anticipate the second volume. But in this time in between celebrating books by James Veltz, it is indeed an honor and joy to celebrate a book for James Veltz. The press of the text, we will have copies available tomorrow morning if UPS finally shows up. Uh, and uh, uh, we intend to have a table, there, well, there, this is listed now at $38, we have them for 20 bucks, and the chance to have Dr. Velt sign it, if you wish, we'll have a place set up at lunch tomorrow. Jim, thank you for this honor and privilege. This is incredible. And it's been a delight. Can you say a few words? What can you say? Just tremendous, tremendous colleagues, the <clears throat> mentorship of Jack Kingsbury. Uh, these guys are my colleagues and my friends, and uh, the fact that they got these guys from around the world, totally shocked at this, I couldn't be more thankful. As, uh, <clears throat> as Oswald Huffman said in his book, what more can you say but amen?